here. The problem, there's a problem beginning to develop in the culture, in society. It's developing. The structures, the roles, the home, all of that is being clearly defined and laid out. Go read in Ephesians 5, Ephesians 6, you see them. Paul reaches back into this, and he sets up that, God set up that structural order back here in Genesis. Paul in Ephesians 5 and 6 reaches back and says, you see that that culture, that structure, that social order? That's what the church, the body of Christ, is to look like. That same order, that same structure, not a hodgepodge, not a mixed match, but a Right there, husbands, wives, family, bosses, sir, workers, it's, and it all starts right here. Now, notice 6-5 of Genesis. Are you guys with me? Okay. All right. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. There is your thinking process. There's man's thinking process. You have two sides to your thinking. You have the logical side, the thinking side, where you look at the facts and you deal with the facts and and you say, "This this is what truth is and this is where the facts are. By the way, that's the part that God designed to run your life is in the fact part, the facts. But then you have this imagination of the thoughts. And you have an imagination side. And that's the creative side. That's the side where you begin to create and to do things. The fact side is where the truth and reality is. The facts. The imagination side. There's where the emotions come in. You know, you hear people, oh, they're creative. Well, what's running the show then? Let me ask you something. Was there really Dumbo the elephant with big ears that could fly? But that guy created that, didn't he? It's not true. It's not fact. Hey, have you ever watched reality TV and noticed that it's not really reality? Because every time I've torn my old truck apart, guess what? It never went back the way those guys had theirs go back. You know, it's not real, is it? First time I ever watched that TV show Survivor. It just came on. I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. Then it dawned on me that off the side, the first 10 minutes won't be recorded. Or on audio. Okay, you're killing the mojo. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's okay. I, I ain't worried about it. We'll figure it out. What was I talking about? Yeah. Survivor. And the guy gets hurt. And then all of a sudden you hear this, medical, medical, we need the medical. And all of a sudden the medical guys appeared out of nowhere. Like, well, wait a minute. They're supposed to be on a deserted island. Then it got me to thinking, wait a second, there's a camera at every angle. So they got to, one, they got to be a camera person. They got to feed that person and house them. and do. I'm like, this is on a back lot somewhere, you know. Come on. Medic- uh, that uh, it was cracked me up, you know. But it's what? People think that's what? Real. See, that sits in the imagination side. So in your mind, you have a fact side. And then you have a creative side where you can create, where you can begin to create a picture of the facts. Being an artist, a poetry, dream, that's where dreams come from. By the way, folks, none of that is wrong or bad. When it's being run and dealt with how God would have it be dealt with, which is with the fact side. (laughs) So you see, the problem is the rest of that verse. Only, the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Jeremiah 17, verse 9, you write that down. It says, the heart is deceitfully wicked, desperately wicked. Whoo. You don't even know your heart. You think you do, and it'll pull a pull the rug out from underneath. You see, folks, they were doing evil. 
continually. Imagine nations, idols, creation, their idols are creations of the imagination. Now watch verse 6. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Whew. You know what man had done? They had left the structure that God had created, the institution. So what's he going to do with them? He's going to put them out. By the way, if you look at verse number 8, now, now Noah, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. That word generation, genetic, Noah had not, and his wife and boys and their family had not participated at all in the genetic re-engineering of the DNA of man that happened back up there in verse 3 and 4, 2, 3, and 4. They had been pure. That's why he found grace. The sons, the fallen angels had come down and visited the daughters of men and messed it all up. By the way, why would they do that? I don't know if you've ever thought about why. Well, they're good-looking women. No. Corrupt that seed line from Genesis 3. Get that seed line, that seed of the woman, mess that thing up. Yeah, think about that. Come over to chapter 9. So what, is the, what does the Lord tell Noah to do? Let's build an ark. Let's get busy here, Noah. Let's get going. He builds the ark. You got the flood, Genesis 9. The flood's done. The waters have receded. Noah's boat sitting up on the top side. He sends that dove bird out, that dove out there, brings back that olive branch. Boy, all the typology is just pinging big time here, what's going on, what's happening. The first three institutions are sitting there. Man's corrupted them. God destroyed man except for Noah and his family. After the flood... 9 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. We're going to have a restart. He tells Noah the same thing he told Adam back in Genesis 2 and 3. No, Genesis 2, 1 and 2, sorry. Then he said, But in this restart, the Lord added something to them. These are there. Volition, marriage, family. Replenish. Add, but now he's going to add something to the equation. Verse 2. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all. But flesh with the life thereof, which is, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require. And at the hand of man, and at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. We have a restart. But we're going to add something to it. You can now go and chase down and be a hunter. Before that fish would come up and look at Noah and you know, fishy mouth and say, hey, teach me. Tell me who I am and what I'm to do. Name me. And Adam would do it, and that fish would be happy. Now that fish is at the other end down deep, and you're out there with a fishing pole and a piece of corn on a hook trying to catch it. It's running from you. Now you've got to go sit up in the deer stand and wait for the deer to come walking through so you can get it. You've got to go hunt this stuff down. Why does he do that? So that they would do what? Spread out. Repopulate the earth. He's just killed everybody. We've got to get it going again. But he adds something to it there in verse 6. Whosoever 
sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. He instituted capital punishment there. He institutes a, a new fourth institution. Now come over to Romans 13. Romans 13. All this is important. It's all critical. I know we've had technical difficulties. You, you didn't miss much. And you, it, we'll tie it all together here for you in just a second. Romans 13 and verse number 1. In Genesis 9, he institutes human government. Okay? For the orderly maintenance of society, he creates human government. To protect the institutions of volition, marriage, and family, he created human government. Romans 13, verse 1. Watch Paul talk about it. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Stop. Soul. What is that? That's an inner man thing. This is all how your inner man is designed to think and how you ought to be thinking about government. Well, I don't like him because he's a... Bl no. You know in Titus he says, speak evil of no man. Ooh. Then he says, pray for the kings. Pray for those who are in authority. Uh-oh. Well, I don't like him because he... Or I don't like her. But that's too bad, turkey. You've got to have the proper mindset here. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of... God. Isn't that interesting? Paul describes the institution of human government. It's an inner man issue. And there's a structure that's to be there. It is an external government. But, in, but that external government requires an internal attitude among the people that are being governed. All right? Now, pause here. Go right back up into chapter 12 and look at verse 19. Because we're going to make a connection here. 12, 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Who's the avenger in that verse? The Lord is. Now go down to 13, 2. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. Human government is the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God. So the government is the minister of God to do, to, uh, he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now God says, wait a minute, I will avenge him. But I'm going to give that right and authority for the time being to government to do. Uh-oh. They carry the sword. They have the right to govern. They have the right to do what? Rule and reign and legislate. Now, the people involved isn't the issue because they're sinful men. It's the ordinance. It's the structure. Okay? Now, I'm going to run back up there to verse Three, real quick. I'm going to put a thought in your head. We're going to pick up with this in, in, in another lesson here in a little bit. For the root, verse 3, for the rulers are not a terror to good works, but to, you see that the evil? He's not talking about murderers and, ban and bandits and mur you know, bank robbers and all that. Notice it's to the evil. It's something very specific. The answer, go back to Genesis 10. Genesis 10. The God-established government, the ability to execute the sword, capital punishment, 
the ability, I mean, when you can take somebody's life, you have the ability really to take everything else. You know that? Just look at history. Nationalism. The fourth institution down here. Nationalism. Every, that's a big word today, by the way. He's a nationalist. There's a reason why it's not bad to be a nationalist. I'm not talking about the political mess. I'm talking about understanding what's going on. God gave the rights. He gave human go- he set human government up and who's trying to weaken the nation? Satan is. So what's he doing? He's attacking the government. He's attacking the nation. Look at Genesis 10. Genesis 10 and Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel here, they happen together. Actually, 11 happens before 10, but 10 comes in as before because of the boys involved. 10-1. Now, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. Then in verse 2, the sons of Japheth. If you drop down to verse 6, the sons of Ham. Verse 21, these are the sons of, uh, uh, of Ham. And then verse 21, unto, the Shem, all, unto Shem also. So you've got the three boys. At the end of each of these sections, look at verse 5. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families in their nation. Verse 20. These are the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nation. Verse 31. These are the sons of Shem after after their families and after their tongues in their lands after their, what? Nation. God divided up the nations. Verse 32. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. Now, when he does that dividing is in chapter 11 when he confounds the languages in Tower of Babel and causes them to go. So you have borders, physical borders. You have a language. If, if I speak in English and you speak of something else, Where are you naturally going to go to where the language is the same? Okay. Then the nation. So you got borders, language, and nations, don't you? Culture. That's the, the nation's culture. They protect this, these three, all day long. Now, our nation, just by the way, It's kind of a weird thing because we have all different nations come here. Melting pot, they call it. I saw a thing the other day. A guy was really upset about the immigrants today being compared to the immigrants of the 30s and the 40s and and the 20s and the, you know, the old back in Ellis Island days. And he said, don't do that. Don't compare those because those immigrants built this country. These immigrants are, are stealing from this country. And I was like, wow, that's a different way to look at that. I never thought about it. We have that melting pot. The nations are established to protect the people. Chapter 11, the languages there. Look back up and at, uh, you, got a, you got a problem in chapter 10. You got a guy show up, verse 8. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Now, Nimrod, being a mighty hunter before the Lord, is not a good thing. I'm just, okay? (laughs) What was the Lord's edict to mankind, to Noah? Spread out. Go hunting. Go chase him down. He was a mighty hunter. You know what he said to the people there at Babel? You sit at home, watch your football games, do your entertainment, do your stuff. I'll go and get the meat. You just come down to the wee sacket over here and pick it up from me. 
Okay? So what does he do? He becomes a mighty hunter. What does man need? Food and raiment, don't they? That's it. Basic needs, food and water and raiment. We saw that. So what do they do? Off he So Nimrod shut down the migration, the spreading out. Chapter 11, verse 1. Here's what he did. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them uh, throughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Well, look at what they're doing. They're all one, one world, one language, one government. They're living together. Globalism. They take away volition and marriage. and fa- They're destroying it. We're all one. They make a city. That's a political center, politics. In a city, you have an economic system. You have a social entertainment system. You've got all of this stuff going on in a city. By the way, do you remember the first city, Genesis 4? Cain made it, built it, named it after his boy so he would have some posterity. And you know what he did it? He did it in rebellion to what God told him to do. Look at the end of verse 4. What did God told Noah and man to do? Scatter, fill it up. What did they say? Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Let's don't spread out, let's congregate. Then they build a tower. Tower in your scripture represents religion. So now we have a spiritual component that comes along with the political component. And they're doing it all in rebellion. Verse 5, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower. By the way, that that, that tower, you take 2 Samuel 22, Psalms uh, uh, Psalms 18, Proverbs 18, Israel. God was to be Israel's tower. That's the religion, okay? Verse 5, and the Lord came down to to see the city and the tower which the children of men build. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. They have all the one language, and this they begin to do. And now and now, nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Uh-oh. Thinking is wrong, isn't it? So what does he do? Verse 7, Go let to let us go down there, confound their language, and they may not, that they may not understand, understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel. God's response was to confound the languages. God's response was to scatter the people, to put them into nations, borders, language, and culture to come along and to put them where they belong and should have gone on their own accord. And they didn't do it. Come back to Romans 1. Paul illustrates this and describes it. Satan is weakening the nations. He's simply destroying the thing that makes the nation strong. What was that? To do what God said to do. By the way, Satan attacks the volition of man. Yea, hath God said. Did God really say that? He attacks marriage. He attacks the family. And he attacks nationalism. And it's all designed to simply weaken man. What's God doing here, by the way, folks? He's reorganizing. He's restructuring. He's got a plan to take back what Satan had taken, the government. Do you follow? No? Not so? A little bit? 
Look at Romans 1. Verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from, create, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Paul's describing Genesis 10 and 11. Your, the, your thinking side of your brain knows this to be true. There is a God. You're born with that in you. You get talked into believing something else. You think about our culture today. Well, they're born that way. No, they're not. They're usually talked into it. That, I don't know if you saw in the news, that young man, that little boy over in Texas where mom and dad were fighting over him. And instead of learning to be a parent, I mean, they're squabbling, they're getting a divorce or whatever, Rather than coming to understand that your children are going to say and do what you want them to say and do so that you accept them because you think your marriage is the family too. So that little boy would, be, would do what mom would want him to do and the little boy would do what dad would want him to do and the judge says, well, then he's got to be transgendered and do that because that's who he really is. Say, what? What? That's a lack of parenting. That's people who should never have gotten married and who should have never had kids. See? That's weakening the nation, isn't it? Folks, you know what gender you are. Come out of the shower and look in the mirror. Okay. It's what it is. But what, what does our culture say? Well, it's really who you want to be. You see, folks, what does verse 19 and 20 say? You know the truth. It was instilled in you. You've just been talked out of it. Verse 21, I'll get off that. Here's how it happened. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their... There's that creative side. And their foolish hearts were dark, and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man to the birds and the four-footing beasts and the creeping things. And God, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. What did they do? They know the truth. They just let their imaginations take over. And they were duped by a religious system. They were deceived. Now come back to Genesis quickly. Well, you see all those verses? We ain't getting there. Hey, you wanted to know where we're going. There they are. Genesis 11. Well, you know what? Yeah, yeah do, do, let's do Genesis 11. This, folks, this is, this is something nobody else in this country today is talking about but us. Gen Genesis 11, what does he do? They, verse 7, God goes down, confounds their language, doesn't he? Verse 8, so the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. You know what they naturally did? Scattered. They naturally begin to look for those who are of the same language, borders, and cultures. Language gathers people together. Common language. Borders. A definable, guardable protection boundary. Culture that gets developed inside of it. If you look at chapter 12, what does the Lord do then? 
What, well, what did Romans 1 say there, verse 25? He let them, or verse 24, he gave them up. You know what? The greatest judgment that God could have ever done to man, he couldn't flood the earth again. He promised Noah he wouldn't. But you know what the greatest judgment God placed on humanity was letting them go to their own accord. Then he reaches over, Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said, past tense, already did this. It was already set up back in chapter 10 when he's dividing out the nations, setting them up. Had said to Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee and I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curses thee and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. You know what he did? He went over and set up his own nation. And he came along and he said, Abram, You've got free will to decide to do this or not. You know, Abraham could have told him, no, thank you. We'd have been reading about somebody else. You're going to get married. He's married, Sarai. You're going to have a family. Moses, or, oh, Abraham says, I'm going to have a what? <laughs> Hadn't happened yet. But we're going to do a family, and I'm going to make you a great nation. You see, the Lord's answer to the rebellion of man was to form his own nation. And that nation was going to be what was going to come now and move into and to take over the government of the earth. Exodus 32, verse 1 over there, Israel comes out of Egypt. They're out of Egypt, and you know what they say? Let's make us some gods like we had back there in Egypt. What'd they do? They messed up. Oh, where to go? Man, wish I had another hour with you. No, I think the shower folks will be a little upset. You see, folks, Satan's design is to weaken the nation. And he does it by them simply rebelling against the word of God. He does it, man, see, that's what the rest of those verses are. That's the good stuff. I know you'll be back, but I might not be. Look over at Isaiah 26. Sorry. Just give me two minutes. Have <laughs> you heard that before? <laughs> Look at Isaiah 26. Checks in the mail, baby. Look at Isaiah 26. Look at verse 1. Folks, if you can grasp what we're talking about, it will help you understand what's going on around you. You won't worry about it because it's in the Lord's hands ultimately. But you have the knowledge, you have the ability to not be tossed to and fro by every wind that blows at you. Isaiah 26, verse 1, In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. So we're talking out there in the kingdom. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Look at that. Walls and bulwarks around Israel. Therefore, they're, they're there for protection. If you come back to chapter 7 of Isaiah, Isaiah 7, my wife's going to kill me because we're here too long. Verse 6, Isaiah 7, verse 5, because, of, because Syria, Sir, Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Rimelah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, let us go up against Judah and vex it. And let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabal. Look at that three-pronged attack. Three folds. What are they going to do? We're going to come up, and we're going to vex it. 
Think about you and I today in the body of Christ. He comes up and he vexes us, doesn't he? He vexes it. And what does that cause? He vexes it. Beat on it constantly till you find a weak spot. So then we can go in and set up a king. And you know what Israel does? They repeat that thinking process repeatedly. They allow the vexation, they allow the weak spot to come in. Come over to Proverbs 15. How does he weaken the nations? He finds a soft spot. And he beats on it. And he's looking for a hole. And he finally finds a hole in Israel. And he gets in it. Proverbs 15, verse number 4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perversiveness therein is a breach in the spirit. How does, he, how does he weaken the nations? He first goes after the heart of its people. The wholesome tongue. The Lord Jesus Christ had a pure tongue. But the nation was perverse and it became a breach in, in, in the spirit. There's a hole in the wall for Israel. And just as it is for Israel, it can be for you and I as well. That's why we're looking at this. We come back over Psalm 60 and, we'll, and I'll be done. I promise. Well, Psalm 60. You see, folks, you and I, we're, we sit in this. Paul says the orderly function, the, the social structure, here it is for you and I. Volition, marriage, family. Be who you are in the government you live in. Be a good citizen. You're an ambassador. You represent a foreign government and a government here on the earth. Be that. But look for, be careful of the breach. Psalm 60, verse 1. O God, thou hast cast us off. Thou hast scattered us. Thou hast been displeased. O oh, turn thyself to us again. Thou hast made the earth to tremble. Thou hast broken it. Heal the breaches thereof, for it shaken it. They cried to heal the what? The breaches. Heal them. You're in Psalms. Might as well look at 106. Verse 23. Therefore he said that he would destroy them. Had not Moses his chosen stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. Moses, back in the Exodus there, he stood in the what? In the breach. How that Satan weakens the nations today, how he weakens you and I, is by an onslaught of vexation, looking for that weak spot. So then he can then get in, and he can set up, an, he can set up a situation where you are going to cave. And when you cave, he's won, makes that breach. And he does it, not by some physical activity outside coming in and banging up against your head, but rather he does it subtly. He will come along and say, you don't have a Bible. Pick any Bible you like. This one's got pretty pictures in it. This one says what you want it to say. This one looks good. What is this stuff about right division and sound doctrine? You don't need to know that stuff. What do you mean you meet at 9.30 and don't get done till 2? What is all that about? You, uh, 12. <laughs> Doesn't he? He comes in and he causes trouble that way. You see, he's not worried about the guys down at the bar watching the football game now. He's not worried about the church down the street that doesn't use a King James Bible or preach 
right division, dispensational Bible study. You know where he's worried about? You and I. And he's worried about our impact out into the nation around us, the community. So you know what now is? Now, to speak anything from this is now what? Hate speech. Now, on the Internet, YouTube and all those guys are going through, and anytime we say anything, see, I'll get probably a little note about the comments earlier. They're watching us. What are they looking for? A breach. We need to stand in the breach. And you do that by the truth. It starts with us. It starts with us deciding to stand on God's word, rightly divided, and then go live our lives on who we are in Christ. Now, all that's intro to some stuff we're going to be talking about, okay? And I beg your your indulgence this morning, all right? Why does he we- how does he weaken the nation? By just storming the wall, using false doctrine, bad information, and causing the hearts of the people to go, I'd rather have that than that. Thank you very much. We'll see that he did that with Eve. And we'll see that illustration, okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And I thank you for the patience of the folks here to sit and to listen to be interested in what we're studying. And, uh, Lord, I just hope that it gives them a, 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 a look into what's going on behind the scenes and that we would then be able to stand in the breach with the truth of your word rightly divided and the sound doctrine that is there. And we just give you the honor and the glory and the praise. In your name we pray. Amen.